All right. Welcome back, everybody, and uh, thanks for cutting out a bit on your uh, important coffee break discussions. But it is great to have um, some talk and questions during the uh, during the presentations, except for mine. So Charlie, keep quiet. Um, <laughs> No, no. So listen, we, we had a, a really nice set of introductions from Stefan and from Malcolm. And uh, Stefan touched upon the, the basic elements we need for origins of life. I want to look at that a little bit more um, microscopically in some ways, no pun intended, um, and really think about what that means in terms of exploration of the rest of the solar system and elsewhere, because there are some really profound implications for where origin of life may have started in terms of where we would go to look. Um, so first thing I want you to do, everybody, is close your eyes for a minute and think about the most primitive life that you know. Close your eyes and think about the most primitive life that you know. <laughs> so it could be President Trump, it could be your, you know, office neighbor who's sitting beside you and whistles all day at work, like I used to do. Um, it could be, you know, your schoolhood uh, neighborhood friend who used to annoy you. But probably with the introduction we've had, most of you would have thought of a microbe. And uh, if we think about the microbes, we would think also if we went really primitive down to archaea simple, microscopic, single-celled organisms. And if we were thinking about the origin of life, that's what we want to create, right? But the thing to remember is that even the most primitive microbe is already an incredibly complex city state, if you, if you like. Or if you think about something like a superorganism, it's already a highly structured, physical, mechanical life machine. It has, you know, these triple membranes that incorporate a cytoplasm whose composition is different from its exterior. It has exchange pumps that are across this membrane. It has organelles internally. It has, of course, this complex DNA. It's got all kinds of operations that help this to make this chemical reaction form life. So if we think about exploring for life elsewhere, of course, this is what we think about. But more importantly is, how do we get to that state? And so there are two really big questions. Stefan touched about that. How did life get started? But from my context as a geologist, like Malcolm said, it's also, where did life get started? What environment, what habitat helped this kind of complex uh, material get organ organized? So life life. Well, we're not even going to go there. So. You said most primitive. I think viruses, but you don't yeah. like viruses. Well, most people don't include that as life, but even to make something like a virus that can seek out other chemical reactions and interact and cause changes, that kind of complexity and that organized reproducible complexity is really what we're after, right? About changing the environment. And uh, we've talked about that in terms of altering the atmosphere on planets as an exoplanet signature. So. Everybody knows now that uh, these amino acids are everywhere. They're found on the Murchison meteorite. They're found out in space. They're found on Earth everywhere. So making organic molecules is not hard. In fact, it's the default. They're just everywhere, right? We found them on the comets. We found them in outer space. They're all over the place. And if we look at this kind of pathway from amino acids to RNA to DNA to life, there are, I will simplify, oversimplify, there are two main knowledge gaps is how do you make complex polymers to lead to RNA? And then, of course, how do you organize DNA and others into functioning cells? Those are two enormous leaps of complexity, which we, which we, stepped, which we uh, touched on earlier today. And I'm going to examine that a little bit um, at the moment. I'll go through this very quickly in terms of the very broad context. You could say that in a evolving universe, you need to be relatively late in its history to concentrate the large ion elements, such as uranium, all the metals that are required to help make polymers. There are metals that are required to bind polymers, such as zinc, other elements like that. So you have to do a lot of star bursts and reforming to get down to that stage. You could argue should be late in a universe history. Of course, we want to be somewhere in a galaxy where there's uh, rocky planets with water and uh, within that habitable zone, as, as we've heard about this morning. So that's all really good as the, as the background. 
Here's Earth up here, right in the habitable zone. Mars maybe on the edge. Venus probably a bit too hot, that Goldilocks idea. But if we think about using Earth as an analog and looking for where life is, it's actually not very helpful. Because life is everywhere. It's in the clouds seeding raindrops. It's all over the face and the scum of the Earth. And it's four kilometers underground, just living on chemical energy, right? Life is everywhere. So if we want to look on the current Earth for where life is, it's actually not a great place to look. And partly that's because the very oldest rock record has been obliterated, so we really don't have the way to go forward on that. So we're stuck a little bit, and of course we use a lot of theory and other exploration ideas to think about the origin of life. Currently, the most widely accepted habitat for where life may have started is in the deep oceans around these vents that spew out hot mineralized water into cold seawater. And the exchange, the chemical and thermal gradients provide the opportunity for complexity, right? So we have 300 or 450 degree water belching out of these beautiful black smokers and they react with seawater that's at zero. They form these chimneys with these very high thermal gradients and that allows ions to exchange and provides energetic complexity for which you can start developing complex molecules. So that's been really of, of great interest. And that seemed to be supported by the fact that um, all of the most primitive microbes on the tree of life, here are the three branches that we've seen, all of the most primitive microbes are hypothermophiles. That means they maximize the metabolism at very high temperatures from between about 100 to 120 degrees C. This was the, uh, the view back in 1996 by Stutter, so that's already 20 years ago. Um, and so that sort of supported this idea that life may have originated under very hot conditions, such as these black smokers. But it turns out that with modern advances in, uh, in phylogenetics and understanding of microbiology, this picture no, real, no, no longer really works. A much more recent compilation, this is already um, probably pretty old, but you see the hypothermophiles are in here, and in fact, the most primitive organisms closer to Luca are in fact mesothermophiles. They maximize their metabolisms at moderate temperatures, characteristic of environments different from those black smokers. So this becomes a problem with thinking about black smokers. And so the community said, okay, we'll go off axis and we'll go to white smokers. At lower temperature, the chemistry is different, but they still have the potential for making these complex water rock interactions and making very complex sort of iron sulfide, nickel sulfide boxes, these cage networks that are interesting in terms of forming sort of a structure for cells and also complex chemistry with lots of free hydrogen, lots of ions floating around and still a temperature gradient here. So that's now currently the most favorite model. So a bit of a shifting paradigm, but there's problems with this as well. And really, it's an extremely fundamental problem that people have known about already for more than 30 years. And that's called the water problem. NASA's roadmap for astrobiology is follow the water. That's for living life. But for prebiotic chemistry, there's an enormous problem. And that problem is summarized here in this uh, slide from Nick Hutt at Georgia Tech. All the reactions that go to make amino acids bind together into dipeptides and proteins, sugars going to disaccharides and carbohydrates, nucleic acids to make RNA and DNA, they all need to kick out water. They're all dehydration reactions. It's the energy of dehydration that bonds the simple organic molecules together. They will dissolve in the presence of water. So the oceans are out for the origins of life. You cannot do it. And there have been, you know, big groups that are doing experiments in the lab of the deep sea black smokers, and they cannot make organic polymers. So life, forget about that, prebiotic chemistry is the key to understanding the habitats required to generate the complexity to then organize and make life. This was known, as I said, already back in 82. Water may be essential for life, but this person, Karen Smith, noted that all the major biopolymers are metastable in aqueous solution. 
oh dear. <laughs> like, hello, we knew that since 1982. Colleague of mine, Dave Deemer, scientist at Santa Barbara, he's shown that you can heat a solution of amino acids and water forever, but no polymers will be produced. On the other hand, synthesis can occur if the amino acids are in a dry state. The source of that energy is that water molecules have the potential to leave the system, right? Oh my God, why haven't we followed this up and where are we? The other really important thing to consider is that prebiotic chemistry needs more than just oxygen, hydrogen, phosphorus, and um, carbon. There are a lot of different, very specific elements. One of the keys there is that the cytoplasm of all modern cells across all three branches of life have a very unique um, ratio of potassium over sodium. And that ratio is not the ratio in seawater. It's the ratio in fresh water. So if you think about where am I gonna go to do my shopping cart for all the components I need, right? The oceans, if it's a deep sea black smoker, should have this kind of oceanic ratio. It doesn't. So fresh water does. That's interesting. The other thing you need is that to make uh, complex organics such as pentoses, a very important um, molecule in the steps towards RNA, for example, you need other anions. And in fact, it turns out that no other mineral is as satisfactory as borate. Now borate's a mineral, but it's got boron to stabilize pentoses across this critical range as pH drops. There's two really important things here. You've got to concentrate ions other than just carbon, oxygen, phosphorus, and you need to have it across a range of pH. Oceans also cannot do that because they are big, homogeneous reservoirs. So even if you have temperature gradients, you do not get that range of pH. This again has been known for a long time. The other thing that's really exciting in this field is that this is Dave Deemer again. He's here with a, a little um, organic soup and he's pouring it into an active hot spring on land. Now, this is done in Kamchatka where they don't worry about environmental interference so much. But the amazing thing about his experiment was that those organics all migrated to the edge of the pool. And if you think about hot spring pools, they surge, the edges wet and dry. There are geysers that cause fluctuations in water level, causing wetting to be dry. But in his experiment, he showed that his lipid organic soup naturally formed vesicles about the same size as cell structures, making bilipid membranes. And they actually have the ability to concentrate the organics that are in his soup. Furthermore, what they found is that when those pools dried out, those lipids opened up and flattened out. The dehydration of the pool caused concentration of amino acids into complex biopolymers. And on re-wetting, those biolipid vesicles reformed around more concentrated, more complex organics. Oh my God, too, right? That is an unbelievable discovery. And is leading many people to suggest that prebiotic chemistry had to occur on land, not in the oceans. Guess who thought of that a long time ago? It's a fellow called Charles Darwin, who in a letter 145 years ago, who was good mate Charles Hooker said um, to, uh, to Joseph Hooker, said, but if, and this is probably one of the most famous quotes in science, and what a big if, we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, etc., that some protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. So in this micro, in this prebiotic chemical world, he'd already thought of Darwinian evolution, right? And he thought of some warm little pond on the surface of the land. And in fact, this was the dominant paradigm for origin of life studies before the discovery of deep sea black smokers. The community got so entranced by these big two worms, by crabs crawling around four kilometers under, under the ocean, no light, all just chemical life. The community just got entranced by this wonderland and this discovery that communities could live just on chemical energy, not on sunlight. So that was a transformative period around the end of the 70s. 
So I'm a geologist, and what I now want to do is to introduce you to, we can ask, let's go back as far as we can on the rock record. What can we learn from the rock record in terms of where the oldest life was living? <clears throat> and so as Malcolm has pointed out, uh, we work up here in Northwestern Australia in the Pilbara, and it has some of the best preserved oldest rocks in the world in this little area right in through here. These are all big granite domes, and the darker rocks here are volcanic and sedimentary units. Right in the middle of this bullseye is a place called the North Pole Dome. And I only found out last year why it's called the North Pole Dome in the middle of one of the hottest places of Australia. But they discovered gold there while Peary was exploring, exploring for the pole. And they were so entranced by the magical series of exploration discoveries that they said, oh, well, we'll call this the North Pole Dome. Totally inappropriate. This is like a frying pan there in the summer, well over 45 degrees Celsius. But it is a geological wonderland. There's a, a series of rocks that are exposed in this domal envelope that the rocks have been pushed up and tilted on their side and then eroded. So you can walk through the old seafloor crust three and a half billion years ago and see absolutely primary features, ripples on the beach, see big volcanic flows, spectacular. And this area of blue rocks is known as the Dresser Formation, where some of the oldest forms of life are preserved. Now, it was found through the mapping that we did and others that this unit of sedimentary rocks in blue, which tilts away to the right here, is underlain by this whole series of black little streaks here. These are veins, the fossil plumbing system of fluids that were pumped through the rock, through fractures in the rock, and they're hot, chemically rich sources of fluid, and they come back to the surface. This is what they look like. This is a bit of quartz, that's all. Beautiful circular, it's obviously filling in open space. It was a boiling fluid. And uh, here's another one of these veins with a silica rich core. I'm not gonna say chert today because of Lucy. I refuse to say chert. Silica rich, it is chert, but it's not. And um, beautiful crystals also growing on off the walls. These are sulfate crystals, a mineral called barite. So these veins we know formed at temperatures of about 150 degrees because otherwise you don't get barite. Lower down, they were probably at about 300. And as that hot fluid moved through the crust, it totally transformed the chemistry of the rocks that it interacted with. So these were basically acid baths. They were high, uh, very low pH, high temperature, and they changed what should have been like green and brown rocks into these white clay-rich rocks. And I just got a date back from ANU on clay from these deposits that are 3.2 billion years old. It's the oldest clay ever dated in the world. This is early Archean acid sulfate alteration because this huge volume of fluid moving through it. More about that later. As Malcolm said, beautiful surface outcrops of stromatolites that cut up through beds of sediment. These are structures that are growing off the sea floors, positive topographic expressions. We did a drilling program in 2004 with a group from the IPGP and uh, to get fresh unweathered materials so that these rusty red and black rocks actually in drill core turned out to be beautifully fresh pyrite, iron sulfur. These are the structures. This is a smaller one. These are only about a centimeter across or so, but beautiful. Again, features growing up off the surface of the sea floor and overlaid by another unit of sediment through here. These are undoubtedly biogenic for a number of reasons that we can go into later. But it turns out that these are mineral rich um, stromatolites, not just that sort of limestone reef story. So yeah, we came up with this model. But as it turns out, we no longer consider that it was always submarine. With our recent discovery of a paper published this year, we found evidence of surface hot springs at 3.5 billion years. So not all submarine, but actually an exposed land surface. And it's because of this little rock that my student Tara Dofic found, very unusual silica rich rock with very distinctive layering in this botryoidal fashion and very complex textures where one set of layers gets overgrown by another and it curls down through here. Now I've never seen anything like this in 25 years of mapping in the Pilbara, so thank God for students. They, stuff, they see stuff that you walk over every day of your life. But the key features were actually recognized by Malcolm. He said, when we first looked, he said, oh, this could be geyserite. Tara and I looked at this. We'd never heard of geyserite. Geyserite, never heard of it. 
and I can so I'll look up my book, 1972, talked all about it. So here's the, here's the rock. These are blobs. These are 3.5 billion year old textures. And these are textures from modern hot springs from New Zealand. These are like a couple of years old. <clears throat> so here this botryoidal form. There's that botryoidal form from recent geyserite. Geyserite is a rock made by the geyser. Pretty simple. But geysers are complex. They have splashing water, they're rich in silica, and as they fall down, they precipitate silica. And they do it in this irregular fashion because splashing water creates irregular surfaces. Here's another interesting feature. You can see those botryoids here are overlaying them by flat layers of sediment. And there are these slump structures. You can see these sort of uh, quite ductile looking slump structures. Well, this is one I found at one of my favorite places in Australia and New Zealand, just because of its name. The name is Oraki Karako. Love it, it sounds like a parrot. But here you see the same slump structures through here. This is because the, the silica is actually soft and hot, it just mm, it sags. And then most importantly, we found this feature, which I mentioned comes from up here. Here are some layers that are cut off by another set of layers that continues and have those botulinal shapes that grow outward and downward. Well, here's an exact analog from New Zealand, same scale. And you can see the layers come out and those botryoid shapes form outward and down. This is because this was the lip of a hot spring pool. There was a channel of the geyser water coming out. And as that channel formed, it precipitated minerals that overgrew that lip of the channel. These are one-to-one -one correlations and prove beyond that formation from a geyser. The last final key was that these fine layers, and these are only about 50 to 100 microns wide, alternating between black and white, are actually alternations between titanium rich layers and potassium and aluminum rich layers. So these are the same clays that we have in those white altered pillows and come from acid leaching of the volcanic rocks and the residue leaves this enrichment of titanium as a mineral called anatase. Well this mineral dichotomy is known from modern hot springs like Montserrat. So we totally know that this feature formed from a big geyser. Now geysers are exciting because they can erupt every hour and they cause wetting drying cycles in material that have the capability for having organics in them. And what we found furthermore, there's two other aspects of this I wanna show is that not just did we find geyserite, but we found signs of life in that geyserite. So in between those layers of the siliceous rock, and I'll just, whoops, I'll just back up um, one second. Um, just to show you, in between these layers where the geyserite is, you see these brown rusty layers? Well, we looked at those brown rusty layers and we found these beautifully circular structures that are lined by inward growing radial um, crystal fans. This means that those circular structures, they're spheres, they were hollow in a rock, in a sedimentary rock, precipitating in silica. How do you get a gas bubble <coughs> trapped in a rock? It's not easy. The only thing, and this is again going back to Iraqi Caraco, here's a geyser just up here. This is the outflow channel. All of this is microbial goo. It's all microbial mat living in that warm, not hot water on the edge of a hot spring. Here's what they look up in close, beautiful conical stromatolites. And can you see all the bubbles that are trapped? Microbial communities produce a saccharide, an EPS, an extra polymeric substance, which is very sticky. It's a big goo that protects it from UV radiation. And in that EPS, you can see it traps all these bubbles. And those bubbles are actually caused by metabolizing cyanobacteria. They're making oxygen, but it gets stuck in the EPS and it gets trapped. So actually those bubbles in that 3.5 geyserite are relics of EPS trapping gases and it's a biosignature. Oh my God, number three, right? Fantastic. We also found, here's a little stromatolite uh, it's about three centimeters across, a very peculiar layer underneath that has vertical fabric, like a set of candelabra. Can you see how they're all branching upwards? So this is not a feature that happens in sedimentary rocks. This is probably a hallmark of biology. So we went to investigate that further. We went on the nuclear reactor and did a, an analysis with uh, neutron beams to see if there were sort of, you know, these uh, regular sort of mineralizing features or if it was more complex. And this is what it looks like in 3D. They're bridging structures, they're little bulbs, you can see branches. This is clearly the complexity hallmark of life in hot springs. 
So we have life in hot springs, and this is totally hot off the presses from a colleague of mine I'm working with in Western Australia. Remember those pyritic stromatolites? This guy's a total genius. He's done um, some acidic etching of the pyrite, and he's found entombed in them microfossils. These are carbonaceous spheres caught in the act of splitting three and a half billion years ago. These are the oldest bona fide microfossils in the world, two weeks old, just for you. And so there they are splitting, right? And we also have found these twisted strands of carbonaceous material. These are EPS strands preserved all in the pyre. It's just so thrilling. Anyway, so, um, but the, the other main component of this hot spring story is that whole idea about the extra chemistry in nature, right? So we've got the organics, we've got the wetting drying, but what about the chemistry? What about boron and things? Well, amazingly enough, in some rather unexciting looking rocks that have some little rusty layers, he said, oh, these look like stromatolites. Let's take a look. Here's what they look like in thin section. It's just a millimeter here. Can you see all these little crystals? These all these little green crystals are packed in this one layer of these rusty, and it is actually overlain by broken up geyser right here. So we know we're in the hot spring environment, right? Well, it turns out that those crystals are all of a mineral called tourmaline, which is rich in boron. And if we look at the boron, its isotopic composition is down here of non-marine water. Seawater is up here. So this is clearly, again, on land, fresh water with life. So we've got boron, but it gets better. We know that there are modern hot springs. This is from Ladakh in India. This is the hot spring that's actually, all the vapor has been crystallized by ice because it's so cold, but there's the outflow vapor. It's called baratic center. It's rich in boron. These radiogenic elements get concentrated by the hot water. And then when we look at those pyritic stromatolites in detail, here's what they look like under um, scanned electron microscopy that we can analyze. There are also laminae that are enriched in zinc. Zinc's another one of these key elements for prebiotic chemistry. So there was zinc in the system. And we also know that nearby, there are these unusual layered carbonate chert rocks, and they have very distinctive, unusual kind of flocculated gradations from carbonate to chert, carbonate to chert. These are clearly evaporative couplets from a changing lacustrine environment. But the unusual thing is that the, uh, the carbonate has up to 34% of a mineral called Kutnahora, which is rich in manganese. Manganese is another one of these critical prebiotic elements. So we have started to find that we can recreate an environment at 3.5 billion years ago that not only has life in hot springs, but has all the chemistry that we need, including zinc and manganese and wet dry cycles. This has got it. In fact, it's better because it's got a lot more complexity could this be a guide to the origin of life from three and a half billion years ago? Now, the exciting thing about hot springs is you can have within 100 meters extreme chemical diversity because hot springs don't just occur as one pool, they occur in fields of hundreds of pools. This is an example from New Zealand. Here's Lake Taupo. All of these little black things are hot spring fields. It's in a rift setting. But here you can see a pH of two. This is highly acidic. And this is neutral, you can cook your fish in that one. That champagne pool, anybody been there? Champagne pool, beautiful, right? Unbelievable opportunity for chemical and energetic diversity. And I love this diagram. This came from Rachel Whitaker in a talk she gave at, us at Absalcon a few years ago. But in biology, you have this idea of isolated populations. And if they're able to mix and match their components, they evolve into driving innovation pools that allow for greater fitness. And so there's this beautiful net showing that you can get increased complexity when you mix and match components from these different mm -hmm. pools. So what I get really excited about is the idea of I've got a pH 2 pool, I've got a pH 11 pool, I've got a pH neutral pool. They have geysers, they have subterranean networks that are linked and they splash and mix materials. Talk about complexity. And if you've got a geyser that erupts every hour, you've got this enormous um, um, capacity for making messy chemistry. Not linear, this leads to that, the other thing. You just mix 100 components together, throw it out in the soup, do it again every hour, and you change the system, and you get all this stuff going on. So this led us to publish uh, uh, an article in Scientific American August this year, 
about a paradigm shift, the new origins of life in terrestrial hot springs, not the deep seas. And so our model is outlined in there for you, the care, the read it. We have incoming organic molecules from space. We've got a seven step system of concentrated materials, driving it through these hot spring systems, wetting drying cycles, making these lipid um, protocells. They dry out, they flatten out, they concentrate organics. Organics get more complex because of that drying component. And then they can start suddenly form life, magic step number 16. But then they actually have to go on and adapt to the extreme environment that is the oceans. Very salty, horrible oceans. So if life starts on land and accumulates and complexifies in hot springs, it then migrates to the oceans and adapts to the oceans and then radiates. And then we go back to our high school textbooks, right? So what about the astrobiological implications? I'm just going to wrap up here. So this is quite profound implications. And a lot of people are excited now about Enceladus and, and Europa, these icy water worlds that have global oceans. But if there's no exposed dry land to complexify simple organics, <clears throat> You can draw your own conclusion, right? If you have a water world, these actually don't work. I wouldn't spend $2 billion going there. I think there's just no possibility for doing prebiotic chemistry. Sure, it might be habitable if it's nice and warm underwater and you already had life, right? But you can't make life in those environments. Critical difference, right? What about Titan? Well, Titan's got some very simple organic molecules but without the capacity for a lot of water to generate those systems. I'd say that's not very exciting either. And then finally, what about Mars? I'm gonna skip over a lot of complexity about Mars. We know it had a warm and wet history, as Malkin showed. Uh, there's lots of evidence for water, these layered sediments, um, widespread distributions of clays that can only form through interaction of rock with water. These enigmatic blueberries we know from Earth only form by the interaction of water with rock concentrating and nucleating iron in these blueberries. And excitingly, we know that on the flanks of Nili Patera and elsewhere, there are opaline silica deposits that are hot springs. These are the deposits from hot springs on Mars. Oh my God, number four, right? Just amazing. So it may or may not have had a global ocean that's quite contentious in its early history. But the great thing is that a previous exploration mission to Mars has found hot spring deposits at home plate. So this little area, it's only 80 meters across, it's known as home plate. This is the track that the Spirit rover came across the Sparian Plains through the, uh, through the hills, through Columbia Hills here, and then got stuck in the sand down here. But what it found along the way, Steve Ruff would argue is already a biosignature on Mars in a hot spring deposit. And it's based on the observation of these very unusual deposits of opaline silica, which is a hot spring precipitate. So what he's found in red from Mars, in white and gray from Earth, is a direct analog from the Atacama Desert in Chile, where there's a hot spring under highly evaporative conditions, with very strong UV at 3,500 meters. This is the hot spring outflow channel and it makes these weird kind of nodules of opaline silica with these digitate protrusions. Can you see these kind of finger-like structures? This is the same scale, and can you see on Mars, they're the same kind of digitate protrusions, not layered opaline silica, but these unusual nodules. And if we look more closely, and he flipped one of these things over on Mars, this is, um, this is El Tadio here, this is Mars. They have this very distinctive um, porosity. And um, so there are these lovely analogs. And um, I'm just going to show you what they found when they broke off one of those little fingers from El Tadio. Here's that finely layered material. And it's, of course, full of microfossils. The important thing about hot spring silica is not only can it harbor life, but it can preserve life over billions of years. So this is a cross section of that fine opaline silica. But there are layers that are filled by these green vertical textures. These are preserved microbial filaments entombed as they're living in hot spring silica. And those can last for billions of years, as we found from the Dresser Commission. Biosignatures in hot springs through the geological record on Earth 
with all the right chemistry. So we reckon hot springs are the way to go. It can be anoxic, low pH, acidic to high pH, alkaline conditions, complexity, low concentrations of ionic and organic solutes. So that's good, get the wet dry cycles. You can do clays, which help to organic, uh, template organics. We've got all the right chemistry, and we can make these lipid vesicles, and they can entomb the signatures. So if you give me $2 billion and say, go to Mars and find life, I'm going straight to a hot spring of possible. So just to wrap up, as an academic, I, of course, have to critique everything that comes across my path. So, of course, I take my hat off to Charles Darwin, but I think he could have done a little bit better. So instead of uh, a warm little pond, I'd say some warm little, a few warm little ponds uh, with all kinds of ammonia. We've got to have fluoride in there from phosphatic salts. So I give him about a 97%. Uh, he's done pretty well. Um, and thank you very much.